Awesome. Well, welcome. Um, if you're watching this recording later, my name is Scott McCormick, and we are studying the Gospel of John. Today, we're going to start John chapter 3. And before we dive in, how about I'll pray briefly, and then we will get into the Word. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we don't want to enter this time without some time in prayer. Lord, this is something that we don't do on our own. We, we know that as we study your word, Holy Spirit, you come and help us to understand it. Because that's the only means by which we can understand spiritual things. We're born in sinful flesh. And that flesh taints everything that we try to do. And that includes trying to understand scripture. And so, Lord, I help, pray that you would help us to understand these things, that you would open our eyes and our minds to not just perceive them, but you would also open our hearts to receive them, that we would accept these things as truth, that we would accept um, your son as our savior, that we would accept the, the truth that we are sinners in need of a savior, and that like Nicodemus today uh, in the story that we're gonna read and John, that we would be seeking that truth even if we don't currently understand it yet, that we would constantly be reaching out and trying to understand. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time and bless our words as we dwell in your word together. Amen. All right, so we're in John chapter 3, and in John chapter 3, we are going to see a conversation here between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. And before we um, dive in detail-wise, I'd like for us to read a large section of John chapter 3, because this is a big conversation. We're going to cover it over multiple weeks, but it helps for us to have the context of the whole conversation before we talk about um, the minute details. So let's split this up into um, paragraphs here. So Vamsi, if you'll kick us off, if you'll read verses 1 through eight of John chapter three, I'll read nine through 15. And then if you'll pick back up and read 16 through 21. So I think yours has red letters. So it's to the end of the red letters there. It's the end of the conversation with the So if you'll start with verse one. Okay. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son 
of the only son of god and this is the judgment the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work works should be exposed but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in god very good so here we have a man who has come to jesus at night but i want us to remember a sense of our geographic location here uh, we've been studying over several weeks we here's the sea of galilee and the jordan river we started with john the baptist at a town called bethany where he was baptizing, that's where Jesus um, called a few of his first disciples. Then they traveled to a region of Israel called Galilee. And Galilee is Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. And also a town called Cana, where the wedding was, where he turned the water into wine. Then they went down to Capernaum for a few days, right there on the Sea of Galilee, and then traveled from there to Jerusalem. Now, why were they in Jerusalem? Do you remember? It's just one, just one section before that. Jesus goes to Jerusalem and performs. Yeah, he cleanses the temple. He cleanses the temple. And he's there. The occasion for him being in Jerusalem is that this is the Passover feast. He's there for the whole week in order to celebrate the Passover. You remember, um, if we were to look back in the Old Testament, when Moses, called by God, led the Israelites out of Egypt, they did so after a series of plagues, the last of which was the plague of the death of the firstborn. And in order for the angel of death to pass over the Israelites' homes and not kill their firstborn, they had to paint um, the blood of a lamb on the doorposts and lintels of their home and he would pass over them. And that, that miracle of passing over them is what they celebrate, that God gave them favor and rescued them from Egypt. That's what the whole celebration is about. That's why Jesus is in town. And of course, when he goes to the temple, he finds um, something that's uh, pretty terrible going on in there, that it's no longer a house of worship, it's a house of trade. And so he cleanses the temple. And we see, if, if we look at John chapter two, the last few verses there, that he, he remains in Jerusalem for the rest of the Passover feast, and that's where he is when Nicodemus starts to talk to him. So let's read it, reread that again in verse 23 of John chapter 2. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And last week we, we touched on these two words, that they believed in what in his name because they saw what he was doing, but he did not entrust himself to them. And the root word in the original text is the same for both of these words. And it's almost as if to say he did not believe in their believing, that there was a shallowness to their faith, that they were they were trusting in him to do cool things, but they weren't seeing him for who he really was. Now, we start John chapter 3 with a contrast to that description. Here in John chapter 3, we see a man who comes to Jesus to have a conversation with him. And, oops, that is not, wow, that is not even close to what I wanted. Let's do it this way. My children have really messed this up. Let me, um, lots of glitter there. <laughs> yeah, I told you my kiddos were, were coloring. And um, let's see if I can, there it is. Um, that's not what I want either. If you'll bear with me here. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm gonna hit pause on the recording. It's taking a second to get this, <laughs> get this working. Let's see. Okay, we're back. Let's see if my eraser works this time. Ta-da! Okay. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and it says that, what does it say about Nicodemus? What do we know about him here in the first couple of verses? Man of the Pharisees. He is a man of the Pharisees. Good. What else? 
a ruler of the Jews. Ruler of the Jews. Do we know anything else about him? He comes by night. He does come by night. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, if you if you look in ten verse ten, Jesus calls him the teacher of Israel. Right. Teacher of Israel. Now, when we talk about Pharisees, uh, we have to think about right here, this ruler of the Jews, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jewish community. Um, in those days, the Romans, when they took over a region, they gained full governmental authority, but they would often leave some of the religious authorities there um, to, to help keep the peace, to help continue with their native religions, although they, they also had the Roman religion there. And those religious bodies were allowed to have some level of governance. There were things they were not allowed to do. So for example, they couldn't carry out the death penalty. This is why when they wanted to crucify Jesus, they couldn't do that on their own. They had to take Jesus to the Roman authorities and say, crucify him. So, but they did have some governing authority. And um, in the Sanhedrin, there were two main parties the Pharisees was one, and the other was called the Sadducees. Now, they believed very different things doctrinally. The Pharisees were experts in the law. They focused um, very heavily on personal holiness, but not in a way that um, was brought about by God, that, that, that this was a holiness they tried to achieve, a righteousness they tried to achieve under their own power by following every single minute detail of the law as best as they could. And they even added to the law additional requirements by interpreting things and, and following their traditions. They would, um, as Jesus accused them later, they would pile up heavy burdens on people's backs by teaching them these laws and never lifting a finger to help them. That they, they cared about the, the, the minute details and missed the big picture of what the law was trying to teach them. So those are the Pharisees. The Sadducees, on the other hand, believed something very different. They didn't believe that there was no resurrection from the dead. Well, that led to some very interesting consequences. If there's no resurrection from the dead, if there's no life after this life, that means that there's not a spiritual realm outside of this life either. So they did not believe in angels. They also did not accept um, any other text, but, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this. They only um, believed in the first five books of the Bible, which is the Pentateuch. These were the first five books written by Moses. Um, so that means you, know, you get to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and everything after that they rejected. Um, so if there's no resurrection from the dead, there's no spiritual realm with angels, and they only believe in a very um, small subsection of the Old Testament scriptures, then they, they ended up taking a very materialistic view on life. In other words, if there's no afterlife in which we would receive rewards that are promised for those who do good or punishment for those who do bad, then that means we should, well, we're going to receive those promises in this life. It's a, it's a temporal thing, a now, not a forever. And, and so they had a very materialistic view on life. They were more of the politicians within the Sanhedrin, whereas the Pharisees were more the teachers in the Sanhedrin. So when Jesus says, you are a teacher of Israel, that's what that's referring to. One of his roles in the Jewish community was to be a teacher of the law. The Sadducees were more politicians within the community. So here comes Nicodemus, and he is a Pharisee. And he comes to Jesus. Gen Gentiles are ones who are from a different religion altogether? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So Gentiles are, so you've got, this is a contrast. Um, you see Jews contrasted with Gentiles. So for example, you and I are not Jews, therefore we are Gentiles. That's all it is. Now Jews is not a racial thing. You can be born into the Jewish community. However, um, the Jewish community is a covenant community. It's, it's being bound into a relationship with God, so to speak. And so Gentiles could become Jews, 
by becoming proselytes. This is one of the things that we've talked about in the last few weeks, that process of, of baptism, of circumcision, being brought into the Jewish community, rejecting um, the religions and the practices of your fathers and your family growing up, and accepting in, in, instead choosing to live a life as a Jew and worship as a Jew, the one true God. It's a good question. Good question. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. And there's two thoughts here on why he might have done that. Um, one is that he was afraid or timid. In other words, um, he, he comes here from, uh, from a group of people who, even from the outset, rejected Jesus and who he was. These were the Pharisees and the rulers of the Jews that in general, they saw him as a troublemaker. They saw him as a false teacher. They saw him as um, somebody who they tried to arrest many times during his ministry so that they could get him out of the way and quit teaching the things he was teaching. So one sense is that he doesn't want others to know that he's gone to see Jesus. So he might have been afraid or timid in that respect. Another thought about why he may have gone by night is that Jesus um, was always surrounded by crowds. I'll say crowded here. So during the day, great multitudes followed Jesus. It says, and remember just a few verses earlier, that many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. And it's easy for us to believe as he does these signs and word of mouth spreads, people flock to him. They want to see the signs. Those who are sick want to be healed. Those who are hungry want to be fed. And they begin to follow him around. So if he comes to Jesus by night, everybody else has gone to bed. And he can have a more intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus about what he wants to talk about. I think either of these thoughts are fine. But regardless, he shows up at night to have a conversation with Jesus. And look how he starts out the conversation. How does he address Jesus? What does he call him? Rabbi. Calls him Rabbi. And then he follows that up with... A teacher come from God. A teacher come from God. Now, Rabbi means teacher, but it's also a term of respect. So not all men who were given the term of respect rabbi were actually good at teaching or practiced teaching, even though the word means teacher. But here he's following it up with the word teacher because he really means you are teaching and I'm respecting the fact that you're teaching things. And he says, we know that you are a teacher come from God. He says, we know. Now, if I went up to my wife and said, we know, she would look at me and say, well, what, do you have a rat in your pocket? You know, what, who is this we? It's just you. You came to me. What, what is the we? So who is the we do you think that he's talking about here? Pharisees. He's talking about the Pharisees. Very good. He's intimating that he is not the only member of the Pharisees who is thinking that Jesus really is the real deal. That they're not thinking, wow, this guy is a lunatic or that he is a false teacher or a bad guy. They're seeing the signs that he's doing and they're having to recognize at the very least that he is a teacher come from God. Because in verse two, he continues to say, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Jesus' response to him, to me, is interesting. Does he actually address the statement that, Fer that, that, Pharisees, that Nicodemus made? No. No, not at all. Nicodemus comes to him and just makes a statement. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God. For we know that... No one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answers him completely differently. It's like a 180 topic change. He, he totally skips over the, the, 
the pleasantries, he skips over the small talk, and he looks into Nicodemus's heart and sees the reason why he is there and begins to address that. He, he either sees that or he decides of his own accord, we're going to have a conversation about a specific topic and I get to choose it. And what does he tell Nicodemus? Can you reread for me verse 3? Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Very good. So here he starts off by telling us, truly, truly. Now, there's this double word here. If we were in other translations, sometimes they say very truly. Uh, in the King James, it says verily, verily. This, this double word here, this this repeating of the word is a, is a Hebrewism. It's, it's a way in the Hebrew language to elevate the importance, to elevate the level of whatever you're talking about. And I want us to see an example of that in the book of Isaiah. Keep a finger in John chapter 3 and flip with me to the book of Isaiah. It's in sort of the middle of your Bible. Isaiah is one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. Um, we call him a major prophet because he wrote more than the minor prophets. The major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they just have longer books. Um, it doesn't mean that they were more important or that they did cooler things. They just have longer books. So if you'll, um, if you'll turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Let me write that up here in the corner. Isaiah, chapter 6. And you tell me when you get there. Yeah. We had exactly the same Bible. I'd just tell you the page number. But yeah, I'm, I'm there. Okay. All right. Let's read together Isaiah chapter 6. I'll read out loud verses 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Here Isaiah is receiving a personal commission from the Lord to be a prophet to the people. And this happens in a year of great tragedy for him. He was in service to King Isaiah who ruled for 52 years and uh, under whom the, the entire nation of Israel prospered. So they're in a time of uncertainty and in the midst of that time of uncertainty, Isaiah is given a vision of the throne room of God. And around the throne are these angels who are singing constantly praises to God. And they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You see that repetition again. Holy, holy, holy. Now, God is, um, has many attributes. God is love, but we don't see in the Bible that it says God is love, love, love. God is wrath against all sin, but it doesn't say that he is wrath, wrath, wrath. He is just, but it doesn't say that he is just, just, just. The Bible only raises his holiness to this third power, that, that all of his other attributes fall under this concept that he is holy, set apart, transcendent, 
that he is perfect and righteous in all of his ways. And in everything that he does, it's holy because he is God. And so that, that repetition there, holy, 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 is a raising up. If we flip back to John chapter 3, Jesus' response to Nicodemus starts with the words, truly, truly. He says, what I'm about to tell you is at its core more true than anything else that you've studied before. This is very true. This is truth as black and white as truth can be. And he introduces to Nicodemus a necessary condition. I'm going to write that up here. This is a necessary condition. In other words, you cannot do this unless this happens. The only way for you to do that is for this to happen first. It is a necessary condition. And the condition is that you must be born again. Now, the Greek here for born again is intentionally ambiguous. It can also be read born from above. Now, there are there, there's two conclusions we can make right off the bat there. This, this, is a, this is a second birth. This is not your first birth. You are not born capable of seeing the kingdom of God. This has to happen to you as a second birth. We also know that this is a supernatural birth because you are born from above in this case. And here, the thing that you're unable to do unless you are born again is to see the kingdom of God, which means that in your first birth, you are under spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness. If we keep reading, I want us to skip to verse 5. Nicodemus expresses his surprise and confusion at this, and Jesus answers again in verse 5, Truly, truly, there's that repeated word again, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So in addition to not being able to even see, to perceive, to understand the things of, of God, we are also under spiritual inability inability that not only can you not see it you cannot go into it you cannot reach for it and take hold of it you cannot um, achieve it there's something that you're unable to do spiritually unless you are born again now we've learned a little bit in john chapter one about the new birth and i want us to go back in um and review that. So turn back to just one page to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, let's take a look at verses 12 and 13. Can you reread for me John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13? Okay. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who are born not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Very good. So here it says that they're born not of blood, which means not of natural descent, that this is not um, something that you're physically born into with your first birth. Um, this is not something that if you've got Christian parents who are born again, that when you're born, that makes you also born again. That's not how that works. Um, you could have had a great grandfather who was a preacher. That's got nothing to do with it. Okay, so not of natural descent. It also says that you um, nor the will of the flesh. This means not by yourself. You cannot walk into church and raise your hand and say, "I want to be born again." That's not how that works. It also can't be by others. It says the will of man. So a preacher can't come to you and lay hands on you and say. I declare that you are born again. I'm going to do something to you. These are things, none of these work. This, this is not the path to being born again. It is, it is a second birth. It is a supernatural birth. It is a sovereign birth. Because it says at the very end of verse 13 of John chapter 1, but of God. This is something that he sovereignly does in and through you. 
and it is a spiritual birth. It is not something that has to do with your physical body. Uh, washing your physical body does not cause it to happen. It is something that happens on the inside. It is something that happens to your soul. So this is a necessary condition to even seeing the kingdom of God. And flip back with me to John chapter 3. Nicodemus's reaction is not one of immediate acceptance. He doesn't say, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. What does he say instead? Reread for me verse 4 of John chapter 3. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Very good. Now he's obviously confused here. And I want to talk for a minute about why he's confused. So this phrase, born again, is not totally new to him. Remember, we talked, because you asked such a great question earlier, that there are Jews and Gentiles. And for a Gentile to become a Jew, they go through a process whereby they become a proselyte. And that one of the, the, the there were two sort of uh, ritual acts that they had to do. One was baptism. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Another is circumcision. And the end result there is that in their common language, the Jews would refer to proselytes as having been born again. Well, there's that same phrase again. However, they're not referring to something that is second, supernatural, sovereign, and spiritual. What they were referring to was something that is outward. It was something that was temporal. In other words, what changed from becoming a Gentile to a Jew was what you do. So being born again to them was you've left behind your old life and it's as though you were born anew because you've entered a new life. The things that you were doing are different. The worship practices you're doing are different. You've even gone through this act of being baptized so that sort of symbolically you're washing away the old life. And so He's thinking in terms of this phrase that he's heard in the past, but Jesus is using it in a different way. He says, in uh, one who, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's a spiritual level. This is a man who was a Pharisee, an expert in the law. He followed the law as closely as he could possibly do, considered himself to be righteous, taught other people as much as he could to do the same things. And here you're saying, I have to be born again. Well, that's not even a phrase that we use for Jews. When we use it, we use it for Gentiles. And you're telling me I have to be born again. And so Nicodemus then uses a, pic, a word picture. He says, how can a man, an, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And here's the second part where he's confused, not just on the wording that's used, but on the conclusion that comes from it. Let's focus on this phrase, can he enter? Because Nicodemus here is not confused by the picture of a new birth. He, he uses parables and, and, and word pictures in his teaching. He, he's, he's a teacher of the Israelite people. His problem here is the end conclusion, if this is a sovereign birth, if I have to be born from above, how can I do it of my own power? Because let's think about an old man. Can he enter again into his mother's womb? No. If I think about my first birth, how much did I participate in that? Zero. If anything, I made it harder. Okay, my, my very presence in the act of being born was made it harder. Uh, the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck, for example, when I was born. That made the whole process harder. So I didn't add to that. Here Nicodemus is saying, you're saying that I can't add to that? I, I can't do the right things and see the kingdom of God? I can't um, follow the law that's been given and that grant me entrance into the kingdom of God? And so he's now confused and frustrated by that. 
And that's where we're going to have to stop today. We're going to have to think about this question here. Can he enter? Uh, because next week, as we continue to study, Jesus goes in to explain this more in depth. He gives him this one sentence answer at first, which blows Nicodemus's mind. And then he's going to continue in the conversation to lay out the groundwork, to, to go in depth into understanding a spiritual truth that Nicodemus is marveling at at the moment. And uh, we're going to spend a few weeks on this. We're going we're gonna to even cover John 3.16, one of the most quoted books of the Bible and one of the most misquoted books of the Bible, taken completely out of context and with wrong conclusions made. So as we study this, we're going to see um, the working of the Spirit and its act of, his act of regeneration, uh, which is just another, I want to write this here on the board too, um, when we talk about the new birth, the big theological word for that is regeneration. So you'll hear me say that word a lot. Um, he's going to talk about salvation. He is going to talk about the love of God being poured out by even sending his son to die on a cross. He's going to talk about judgment. We talked earlier before class about judging others. And here God is, um, is, is judging everyone on earth and whether or not you're condemned, which means you're judged as guilty or you're not condemned, meaning you're judged as innocent, depends on what you do with this understanding of who Jesus is and what he came to do. So that's where we're going to go over the next few weeks. So when you do get some time this week, spend some time in these first 21 verses that we've read. Read over this again, because it's going to give us the context as we continue with our study. Sure. It'll do. Awesome. Questions? Thoughts? Um, not yet. I think I read this one. You probably refer to it in your homework or somewhere, but... Um, we have yeah. um, read a little bit of this when we started talking about the new birth. In John chapter 1, we skipped ahead and read to this for some support, and then went back to John chapter 1. And so now we're going to get into the, the details of this as we go through. Yeah, I, I underlined uh, verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Yep. That must have made an impression. <laughs> Good. Good. I am, um, I am not an underliner or a highlighter or a circler or a note taker in my Bible or any book at all. That's just me. And, 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 but my dad, I mean, his whole Bible is filled with notes and underlines and circles and, um, it's a, it's a, it, if you were to open the book and read it yourself, it's like, you've got all this extra stuff that he's added, you know, as he's understood things and ways for him to refer back to other places to fully understand different things. Um, I just, there's, there's nothing wrong with writing in your Bible. I just don't do it. <laughs> I, I have a notebook. That's what I have my notebooks for. So. Yeah. I, I, I underline all the time. I mean, I, I used to not to because usually what I do with books is like if I don't want to keep the book, I'll just exchange, exchange it. We have this book exchanges. So you take a book back, they'll give you 50% of the value. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can offset it against a new book that you buy. Right? Mm -hmm. Not a new book, but people have used other, other secondhand books. So I wouldn't want to uh, really spoil their experience of the book so I used to not do that but I read this book called uh, How to Read a Book <laughs> there you go. It's, it's, it's a very popular book <laughs> so yeah I, I don't know why I picked that but I thought it was funny so I, I ended up reading it and um, it was very helpful actually Good. I mean um, yeah so in that the author recommends that you know you you make uh, feel free to underline, make notes, and all that because it reinforces in your mind that you know whatever you read and you thought about it and you put down something. So mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm gonna do this now. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So, yeah. yeah now um, all my books are like full of notes. <laughs> um, there's a guy that I've been to multiple conferences to to be taught by him. He's a teacher of preachers. 
he teaches what's called ex expository preaching, where you you basically take the text here and you teach what's in the text, as opposed to thinking up a topic and then go flipping back and forth through your Bible to support the topic. Expository preaching says, let's learn what's here. Let's just draw the conclusion straight from the text. And one of the things that he says he does is he'll go and photocopy the page that has the text that they're going to be studying that day. And he'll get his pen and he'll start to circle all of the primary words in the sentence, especially like the verbs that, that you know, that's where the action is. That's where things are happening. Um, and then key words that are repeated throughout the text, he'll circle those too. And I've seen like his notes for a sermon before, and he'll have his notes on one side where he's broken down the text. And then over here where he's just scribbled and circled and underlined an arrow of the whole page if he did that for like every sermon, you wouldn't be able to read his Bible at that point because he had so much in it. But um, that's why he makes a copy first. But um, absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. Well, Vimesy, I'm, I've really enjoyed spending time with you this morning. And um, I'm glad for the time that we get to spend each week in the word. And I wanted to tell you that I love you. This is a time when we don't get to hug people. Um, because of the coronavirus, but I wanted you to know that I love you and I'm glad that we get to spend time together. Um, it means a lot to me that you've so consistently showed up and that you're continuing to spend time in the Word even during the week. Um, that's, that's great. That's really great. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> and uh, it's good to have a teacher uh, who's as enthusiastic <laughs> uh, uh, to teach as I am to learn so well, good. you know it's not yeah <laughs> you know the, wh what they say about you know the teacher appears when the student is ready so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I think you are that teacher for me so I'm, well, I'm really glad to be following along yeah good all right well let's pray and then we'll get to work how's that sound sure. all right sounds good Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time in the Word and this time together. Lord, I pray that you continue to give us many more opportunities for us to spend time in this way, that as we go about our weeks this week, we would remember the conversation that Nicodemus has with Jesus, that we would think about the spiritual truths that Jesus is teaching us in these passages. Lord, I pray that you would impress on our hearts a, a desire and a thirst for your word, because your word is the only source of truth that saves. Uh, so I pray that you would use it to save and to sanctify as you have purposed from all eternity. We pray these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Bobsy. I'll see you later. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Peace. Take care.